Hi, we're back, uh, Math uh, 152, Simon Fraser University. Uh, this is uh, section 11.10, Taylor and McLaren series. I want to uh, draw your attention to the quote. So no matter who criticizes you, <laughs> if you, if you uh, don't think it's a valid criticism, you should uh, ignore it. All right, uh, we uh, discussed last lecture, or, or you uh, discussed with uh, 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 Dr. Stockdale, the power series of a function. So now uh, we're going to say, supposing that f does have a power series representation with some radius of convergence r. So I'm saying, think if I can represent my function in this manner, and that that infinite series will converge for all values of x when x minus a is less than r. Can I figure out what these coefficients here are, these cn's? Because that's what tells me what specific function I am looking at. And I want to do that in terms of the function f. So, I mean, the answer to this question is indeed, yes, we can. Can we calculate uh, uh, those values cn? Let's see how we can do that. Just before I start to do, uh, uh, show you how we can get at those coefficients, let's just uh, recall that we could already find some power series. Uh, 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 for example, we could take the geometric series, which we know this this one here, this the geometric series, the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n equals to 1 over 1 minus x, and that has a radius of convergence where, uh, uh, well, where the absolute value of x is uh, less than 1. So that uh, has a radius of convergence of 1. So we, we could label this function uh, g of x. So now we have an expression, uh, a g of x, and we know that the coefficients in this case uh, these coefficients that we're talking about, trying to figure out how to find these coefficients in this case here, uh, cn is equal to 1 for all n. So in the case where cn is uh, uh, equal to 1 and where a is equal to 0, we have, uh, in fact, the geometric series, and that is this function right here, 1 over 1 minus x, when the absolute value of x is less than 1. and uh, we don't actually know at this point uh, which functions have power series, and uh, if a function does have a power series, how do we find its representation? Okay, so in order to uh, uh, get at uh, how to do that for a large class of functions, I'm going to assume that a is equal to zero. That's just for simplicity. The thing follows it directly for a not zero, but uh, it's, it's just easier to show you the calculations for when uh, a is zero. So let us just make note that that is what I'm doing. a equals zero in this example. And that's just for simplicity. Okay, so uh, we have a assumption that we can form a power series uh, for our function, and it will look like this, c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed plus c4x to the 4 plus dot dot dot. That's what it will look like. And uh, we have some function uh, f of x for which we want to find these coefficients. Okay, so the first thing we could see is that if if we set x to 0, so let's just put x equals to 0, then we would see that f of 0 is going to be c0, because all these other terms, c1x plus c2x squared, will be something times 0, and they will go away. So right away I can figure out that c0 is f at 0. Now I'm going to take the derivative of f of x. I'll just do that beside here. I'll take the derivative of my function. I'm going to take the derivative of f, and that's going to be the derivative of c0 is 0 because that's a constant. The derivative of c1x is c1, and then the derivative of c2x squared is 2c2x squared plus c3x uh, uh, squared plus 4c4x 
x cubed plus so I'm going along here and term by term uh, differentiating. And now I'm going to do exactly the same thing. What's going to happen if I take a look at f prime at 0? So it's still I'm thinking x is equal to 0, and I'm going to take a look at f prime of 0. Same thing exactly will happen. All of these terms, when x is 0, will be 0. So f prime at 0 tells me what c1 is. So I'm making some headway. I've managed to figure out two of the infinite number of coefficients that I need to find. So now I'm going to take the derivative again. So let me calculate the second derivative, and what will that look like? Well, the derivative of c1 is 0, and so then this will be, um, oh, I see an error here. Let me fix that. This should not be a 2. That should be 2c1x. I was taking the derivative of this to get that. So the should be just uh, to the power of x. Okay, sorry about that. Let us take the uh, second derivative now. So that's going to be uh, 2c2 plus 3 times 2c3 times x plus 4 times 3c4x squared plus dot dot dot. So we keep going uh, with the second derivative and then we do the same thing again. What happens at x equals 0? And we get that the second derivative evaluated at 0 will be equal to 2c2, the third coefficient. Okay, then I'm going to do the third derivative. Okay, what I'm going to do actually is I'm not going to keep uh, writing this all out. I'm going to do the third derivative, then I'm going to do the fourth derivative, and I'm going to keep evaluating these things at zero. So why don't you uh, maybe stop the video and calculate a few more of the derivatives, and then that'll allow you to figure out a few more of the coefficients and, and then detect the pattern. So when you calculate the third derivative, then evaluate the third derivative at zero, and that will then be 3 times 2 times c3, and then evaluate the fourth derivative at zero, and that will be 4 times 3 times 2 times c4. And then you we're looking here and seeing what kind of a pattern do we have. And I'm going to make um, a, a, a definition, and that is going to be, I'm going to call the what would potentially look like the zeroth derivative. That is just going to be the function itself. And I define that to be the zeroth derivative. And then I can make a general statement about these coefficients. I can sh I can see from the pattern that's happening. I would just keep going down here, and I would say that the nth derivative evaluated at zero will be n factorial times the c n, the nth constant. Therefore, c n is equal to f to the n in general evaluated at a. I know in my example it was zero, but if if, if a was not zero, the same condition will follow over n factorial. Okay, so simply by taking my infinite series for my function and differentiating and evaluating it at zero or evaluating it at a if you were doing it in the general case, you can figure out what all the coefficients are. And the coefficients then are given by this expression here. So if the power series exists, then these are the coefficients. Okay, we've, we have, we're, we're running under the assumption that the power series exists. Let me just say if the power series exists, then these are the coefficients. Okay, so that's pretty exciting. So now we have a way of actually calculating the, uh, the coefficients of the power series. So we're going to have a, a theorem here, uh, which unfortunately we are not proving, but uh, it is nonetheless true. So the that is that the power series representation is unique. So if the function, again, if the function has a power series, and uh, we, we write it there, the power series like that, then its coefficients are given by this, and there are no other uh, combination of coefficients that we would be able to find. So the power series representation is unique. Okay, what have we done? Uh, a couple of conventions here. Uh, I pointed to this one on the last slide. The, the zeroth derivative is, is, is considered to be the function, and, and we have that uh, zero factorial is one. I mean, in, in, we have that one factorial is one, 
2 factorial is 2 times 1, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, 4 factorial, etc., like this. And then by convention, we have that 0 factorial defined to be 1. Okay. There we go. So again, if the function has a power series representation at A, then the representation must be this thing right here. This representation is called the Taylor series of a function f at A. In the special case where A equals to zero, the Taylor series, well, I mean, this this is becomes zero and then x minus A becomes just x. And so we have uh, the, the zero showing up here. If we do choose to have a equal to zero, then we call the series the Maclaurin series. And that's the one that we initially worked with. All right, we're going to find a couple of Maclaurin series to see this process in action from scratch. Okay, so uh, we're going to try to find the Maclaurin series for the exponential function and for the cosine function. So Again, just to reiterate, the Maclaurin series, that means Taylor series, Taylor series with A equals to zero. Okay, so what are we looking for? We are looking to represent these uh, two functions in a form that looks like this. F of X equals the sum from N equals zero to infinity of f n at a divided by n factorial times x minus a to the n. Okay, in the, in the, that's, that's the Taylor series. Now we, so that's, that's Taylor, Taylor series. Now we've, we've, in this particular example, but when we want to get the Maclaurin series, a is going to be zero. So this is going to be, look, in these examples I'm going to do, we're going to have a equal to zero, so it will look like this, f n at zero divided by n factorial x to the n, and that is the uh, Maclaurin series. Okay, all right, so let us take the first example, a. We want to find the Taylor series centered at zero, also called the Maclaurin series for e to the x. Well, what are we going to need? We're going to need many, many derivatives of e to the x, all of them evaluated at zero. Okay, so I'm going to make a little table and then I'm going to compute that. So I'm going to run n, I'm going to do a whole bunch of them until I can see a pattern. So I'm going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, something like that. And then I'm going to compute the nth derivative at x the nth derivative of the function, and then I'm going to evaluate the nth derivative at zero. Okay, so the zeroth derivative by our convention is simply the function. The first derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The next derivative, e to the x, this is such a nice function. Okay, there we go, they're all e to the x. Okay, then I'm going to evaluate them at zero, and I'm going to get one, 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 they're all one. Okay, so now that I'm, 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 I'm done, really, I just have to see how to put what I've just figured out into this formula. So I would then say e to the x, because that is the function I'm dealing with. I've got f of x is e to the x. So e to the x then is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. And what is the uh, value of fn at 0? It is always 1. So this number right here, fn at zero, that is always one. So it, I mean, I, oh, why don't I just put it here and then I'll, I'll maybe rewrite. That is one, and then I've got the n factorial and then the x to the n. So I'm simply filling in the details into my general expression for e to the x. And I'm not gonna rewrite it because I don't need that one there. So let me rewrite because this is a very exciting moment seeing the, uh, the uh, Taylor series about zero for e to the x. It's extremely important uh, uh, function. So here we are, n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. That's what it looks like with the compact sigma notation. And then if I wanted to, I could sort of write this out with a whole bunch of terms. 
and just get a sort of feel of what this looks like. There it is. So that was uh, what it looks like. So, I mean, at this point, we haven't uh, proved that these two things are equal, but if e to the x has a power series, then that's what it looks like. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> okay, let's do another example. Let's uh, now uh, find the Taylor series centered at zero for f of x equals cosine of x. I do the same thing, I'll make a table. Here's n, and here is the nth derivative of the function, then that, that function in this case is the cosine function, and then here is the nth derivative evaluated at zero. Okay, so I'll make a, a table that zero, one, two, three, four, like this, and then the um, the, first, the zeroth derivative, that's just simply the function itself. Then the first derivative of cosine, that is minus the sine. And then the second derivative of the cosine, that is minus the cosine. So I can take the derivative of minus sine and get minus cosine. And then the third derivative of the cosine function, which is the derivative of the second uh, derivative of the cosine function, I get here sine x and then here I'll get cos x and then I keep taking the derivative of each line as I move down and that's those are the numbers I'm going to get and then I evaluate this at zero the cosine of zero is one the sine of zero is zero the cosine uh, minus the cosine of zero is minus one so I'm making all these evaluations here zero one zero so I'm evaluating the functions in column two at zero to, to form column three. Okay, well I look at this and I notice something here that uh, the only the even, so I'm looking here, this is a, zero is even, so I'm thinking of this number here, that's even, even, even. So only the even, um, even only the, the, the rows where n is even are non-zero. So only even powers are non-zero. Now I do exactly what I did before. I take the general expression and I, I fill in the details that I've now figured out. So let me just write this one out term by term and then put it into the more compact sigma notation. So I'm looking at this here and what do I see? I see that I've got uh, the first coefficient is one and that's times x to the zero. And then the next coefficient is zero so I don't have a x term at all. And then the next coefficient is minus one, that's where this minus one is coming from but I don't need to write the one. And then I get minus x squared over two factorial. Then the next one that's non-zero is here, that is the coefficient on the x to the four term, so that looks like that. And then I would, why don't you, if you are so motivated. Fill in some more of these and assure yourself then of what I am writing here. But that is how it continues. So I write that out and then I can write that more compactly like this here. The cosine is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the two n minus one to the n over two n factorial. So now n is going to run from uh, uh, one, I'm uh, sorry, from zero to infinity, stepping up by one each time. And by putting these, this, uh, the two n there, I am getting exactly what I wrote above. Okay, so this two n there, that that way, I, I this is a way of, for me of avoiding uh, all of the odd powers, which we know are all zero. The coefficients on the odd powers of x are zero. Okay, so when you go from this uh, notation, the sort of expanded notation, into this more compact notation, it's easy to make a bit of an indexing mistake. Start here at zero, uh, or when it should be one, or have two n when it should be two n plus one. Or there, it's easy to make those kind of mistakes. What I recommend you do is when you form a the compact expression here, that you use your own compact expression here, and you then go equals and you run n starting at one, two, three, four, and five, write a few out and then see if they match back here. If they don't, then you know to adjust. 
Okay, so now uh, we have a uh, a Taylor series representation centered at zero uh, for the cosine function. I want you to notice something that uh, I think you might, well, it's kind of cool to see, it, and that is it, you could consider here this to be uh, like x to the zero because x to the zero is one. And you'll notice that all of these, all of these powers are even and that the cosine is an even function. So that is, uh, that is going to show up there and you'll see the, the exact opposite function uh, scenario when you do the sine function the sine function is odd now, in fact now if you believe me with this analysis you'll you'll be able to, you would recognize right away oh when i see the power series for the sine function it's only going to have odd power sine is an odd function okay let's just get a little bit of terminology so we can uh, talk about a few other things uh, we are going to use this notation t sub n of x to mean the nth degree taylor polynomial of f at a which means basically that we keep going until we get to the nth power and then we stop, we truncate at that, at that, uh, at that point. Of course, we've got a polynomial because we have a function that just has um, uh, uh, powers of x in it. So it is a polynomial. And uh, let's see that, well, I mean, the limit, uh, if, if we look at it the other direction in some sense, and then we take the limit as n goes to infinity on the Taylor polynomial, we get back and get the whole Taylor series. If we choose uh, to terminate here, we take a, we have we have a function represented by a, a Taylor series, and if we choose to truncate after n terms, then clearly we'll incur some sort of error, and that remainder that we incur we we call R n. So R n is the the exact value of the function minus the the Taylor polynomial approximation. So our function are, is going to be uh, the sum of your the, the terms that you choose to keep and then the terms that you choose to throw away. So f of x is t sub n of x plus r sub n of x, where t and n are uh, as we just defined them above. Okay, and then if the limit as n goes to infinity on that remainder in the Taylor series is zero, if that's the case, for some x close by to the number on which we um, expanded the function around, if we're in a neighborhood of that number, so what does this look like? This looks like this. Uh, we, ha we have decided it to expand find our Taylor series about some number a, and then we have values of x uh, on either side of a, and this distance here is capital R. So for all values of x inside here, uh, the, the, the uh, function will be equal to its Taylor series, provided that the remainder goes to zero when we take the limit. Okay, let us just uh, get an example to see what's happening here. So we just found the Taylor series for e to the x. Allow me to write it here again. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial, etc. Keeping going, and they can all be written like this. The sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Okay, if I chose to, maybe I wanted to, for example, compute a value uh, for e to the x, what if I wanted to calculate e to the 0.26, right? Let me just make a note, like if I was trying to do that, I wanted to go like this, e to the 2.6. I wanted to figure out what number is that. Then one way to do that would be to simply use this expression on the right-hand side. So I would go 1 plus 2.6 plus 2.6 squared divided by 2 factorial plus 2.6 cubed divided by 3 factorial plus, and I would keep going. And I could, it, the more accuracy I wanted, the more terms I would include. But now I have a method 
for calculating this that relies solely on uh, multiplication, addition, and division. So I, if I was <laughs> so inclined, I could do this by hand, in fact. I could get as accurate as uh, an approximation I would like uh, to, to, two point, to e to the 2.6 by hand by uh, doing a large number of uh, multiplications, divisions, and additions. Okay, so now some notation here. If I were to stop, in fact, right here, I would say, okay, I, I, that, that's as many calculations as I want to do, then that would be what we would call a T3 Taylor series approximation. So that would be T3 of X would be if I take the, the full series and I truncate it after the cubic term. That's your T3 Taylor polynomial. Okay, let me just uh, show why that is that. Okay, your T3 uh, Taylor uh, polynomial. Okay, next thing is my R3. Okay, the R3, the remainder polynomial associated with T3, so that's that we're still on the 3 here, which is going to be the actual function e of x minus t3 of x. So this is how much we leave out when we when we um, when we just use up to the cubic term to make the calculation for e of x. So what do those terms? What are, what what terms are those? Those are these terms here: x to the four over four factorial plus x to the five over five factorial plus x to the sixth over six factorial, etc. All the rest of them. So these ones, this is a finite number of terms, in this case t3, and then here on r3, we've got an infinite number of terms. Okay, and that 3, this 3 is matching here. Caution uh, that you don't want to, when you talk about r3, you, you don't want to have the 3 here, okay, because it's matched with the t3, and t3 means go up and include the the cubic term, and then R3 means the ones that you've left out when doing the cubic one, which starts with the fourth power on X. Whenever we uh, make approximation, like for example, we, we here, we, we decide to make like this, a T3 approximation to E to the 2.6, what we would like to do is bound the error because we, we, we don't know exactly what the error is, but we would like to say it is no more than a certain amount. And, and usually what you want to do is provide sort of the tightest bound that you can. So as close as you, you can give uh, um, without, uh, uh, without saying something incorrect. Let me just give you an example of that. So if, if I was to say, uh, I don't know, I. I haven't been paid for a paydays tomorrow, so I haven't been paid for a couple of weeks, so maybe I have approximately $1,800 in my bank account. But I don't really know how much I have in my bank account, but, but I'm positive I have more than 1000 and I have <clears throat> uh, less than 2600 Then I would say to you, I have $1,800 in my bank account, plus or minus 800 Okay, that would be, then it would, it would tell you that, you know, uh, it gives you an estimate of my bank account and it tells you the maximum amount that, that, could, that you could be out by, in this case, $800. It, so what I want to do is, of course, that, that $800, to, to give you the maximum amount of information, that should be as small as possible. So, for example, if I said to you, I have uh, $1,800 in my bank account and uh, that's plus or minus $4,000. That doesn't tell you as much because then there's a much wider range of numbers that uh, uh, could represent uh, my bank account. So you want to make the bound as small as possible, but of course it has to it has to capture the uh, the all possibilities. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here with the Taylor's inequality. If we wish to. prove that a Taylor series converges to the actual function that we want it to represent, then we have to show that the limit on the remainder term goes to zero. So we're going to use the Taylor's inequality and that fact uh, uh, to do that. Um, let me just get these facts out, out and uh, discussed and then I'm going to give you an example. So there's the Taylor's inequality. Uh, we first uh, we first take the n plus first 
derivative of the function and we give an upper bound on the absolute value of that. So that's what we're going to be calling m. This should remind you about this the error terms that we used in the uh, when we were doing the numeric integration. So for example, the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule, we had similar uh, error bounds. This is the same kind of idea. We're having the m as an upper bound on the n plus first derivative of the function, and that's for all a, uh, sorry, for all x within a distance d of a. So what this, this inequality here looks like, it looks like this. We have uh, the value here of a, and then we have uh, the value uh, well we here here we have uh, a plus d and here we have a minus d and we have our x values this is the x-axis so we have uh, all the x values inside there and for any x inside there we're saying that uh, the if you put any of those x values inside here at, on the n plus first derivative it will be less than or equal to m if that's the case then the absolute value of the part that you leave out, the error that you leave out when you make an approximation with your Taylor polynomial will be bounded above by this expression here. That value of m divided by n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1. Okay, and then we also have a, just another statement here um, that the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial is equal to 0. I just want to point out something here. I mean, you could uh, uh, certainly for um, what I want. Okay, let me back up. Uh, let us me pick some value of x, like say for example, x equals five. And I would, if I was going to look at, so this is an example, x equals five. And then I want to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of five to the n over n factorial and ask what that was. So I'm asking uh, sort of which grows which grows faster here, the exponential function or the factorial function. And that's not quite so easy to do because you cannot, you must not use L'Hopital's rule because you cannot take the derivative of the factorial function because it is not continuous. Okay, so we don't really have an easy way of getting at this, uh, but we are stating here as a fact that the factorial function grows faster than any exponential. It doesn't matter which value of x that you put in there, the factorial function will, in the end, overtake and win. So this limit is zero. Okay, with those two facts uh, in hand, we are going to prove that the Taylor series we computed for e to the x on the previous slide is, in fact, true. Let me just say something for you uh, on an exam. Okay, so let me, I'll even gonna write this. I'm, I'm putting it in writing. On the exam, what, what do you need to be able to do? You need to be able to define the Taylor series and then by sort of by default, that gets you the Maclaurin series as well. You need to be able to define the Taylor, Taylor series. You need, you need to be able to find a Taylor series. You need to be able to find a Taylor polynomial. You will need to be able to bound the Taylor remainder. Okay, what you, will, what you will not be able to do, what you do not have to be able to do, not required, let me put that, not required, is proof that a function converges to its Taylor series. However, it is uh, something that is important. We don't want to represent a function in a different way uh, and then put an equal sign there when for some values of x they may well not be equal. Okay, so we want to uh, be very clear about this and I mean we can just take a, a counter example like that we, we already know the geometric series looking like this uh, equals 0 to infinity of uh, x to the n that is the uh, uh, geometric series and we know that the radius of convergence there is 1 so th th that is a true statement w if we decide to use this thing when x is bigger than 1, we, we generate 
things that uh, don't make so much sense. So, or at least we we need more sophisticated tools to make sense of them. So it, it's not a it's not really just an academic question about whether a series converges to its uh, a function converges to its power series or not. Uh, some some functions uh, converge for all values of x to their Taylor series. Some functions con converge only to, for some some uh, uh, maybe only for one number. Okay, so it's, it's, it, it is an important question, but we're not going to ask you to uh, prove that on the examination. So let's just see how to do this for, for e to the x here. We're going to say, okay, prove that e to the x is equal to this infinite series for every real number x. How do we go about doing that? So I've got a function. There it is. It's e to the x. I've got a value of a the, that I'm ex expanding the Taylor series around. I know that a is zero because these are this, this looking like this x minus a to the n uh, for a equals to zero. So that's my Taylor series centered at zero. Okay, I also know that the nth derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's for all n. Uh, I, I have an expression for the remainder on my Taylor series. When I stop, that's going to be less than or equal to m over n plus 1 times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1, where m is the upper bound on the n plus first derivative of e to the x. Okay, so I'm now I'm going to take a value of, uh, did I use d before here? I'm just going to scroll back to see what my thing is. Yes, is this d here? So that is, I'm now I'm going to move distance d away from a. Okay, so I'm going to be here, given d greater than zero. So I'm, I'm looking uh, around the, from x values around zero. And I'm going to try to see what value I can get for d. I want d to be, as, in some sense, if d is, should be as large as possible, because that means more and more I can use this expression for as many values of uh, x that are within d of a. Okay, so I'm taking this d greater than zero. I don't yet know what it is. And I'm saying for any absolute value of x less than or equal to d, it is true that e to the x is less than or equal to e to the d. Okay, that's because uh, e to the x is a strictly increasing function. It is also the case that the n plus first derivative of e to the x is less than or equal to e to the d. That's because the n plus first derivative uh, of e to the x is e to the x. Such a nice function. Okay, so uh, then I'm going to take a look. What does the Taylor inequality look like in this case? Taylor inequality. Looks like this. Rn of x equals f of x minus tn of x. Okay, so I know that uh, m is uh, in my... I've figured out what the value here is for m, right? That is here. So m is equal to e to the d. So now I can write this expression here uh, using the Taylor inequality that the absolute value of the remainder term, the difference between my function and my nth approximation, uh, Taylor uh, polynomial approximating it, is going to be this, e to the d divided by n plus 1 factorial, absolute value of x to the n plus 1, and that's going to be true statement when the absolute value of x is less than or equal to d. Now I'm going to take a look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this. Okay. Take a look at that. The limit as n goes to infinity of rn of x is the limit 
as n goes to infinity of e to the d over n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1. And what is that limit? We've got exactly the, that, that statement of fact. This is simply a number. This is some number here, not affecting the limit at all. That's just a number. That's a number. And then we've got this other piece here, the um, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And we, I'm claiming that this is 0. It is 0. And that is because the limit we saw on the previous slide is n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial is equal to 0 for every value of x for all x. Okay. So, so as n gets large, this remainder term goes to 0. And then the function is equal to the Taylor series. Let me just write that down. As n gets large, uh, we have that uh, the limit as n goes to infinity on that remainder term, which is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity on what the remainder term is defined to be, the function minus the nth Taylor polynomial is equal to zero. That, that implies that as n gets large, f of x is equal to t of x, the Taylor series. Proof complete, the Taylor series. Okay. So we had not had to specify a value of d. So this is true for, for all d, in fact. And so the, uh, the Taylor, the Taylor series for the function e to the x converges for all values of x. It's very nice, very nice infinite series. Okay, we have uh, uh, on this uh, slide here the second example to do this for the cosine. I'm, I'm going to suggest that you try this yourself. Uh, it, you follow the exactly the same model. It's what is nice about the uh, cosine uh, function is that it is bounded. So is the sine function. So all your derivatives which are going to be sines and cosines when you take derivatives of the cosine function, uh, all of those things are going to be bounded uh, by 1. So I'm just going to make a note of that here. That's something to think about here. m is equal to 1 in Taylor's inequality. Other than that, the, the program follows ex almost identically to what I just did. So strong recommendation to stop the, stop the video and uh, try to do this example for yourself. All right. Let us just take a look at some important uh, power series that we have uh, seen or that we will shortly see or perhaps that you will uh, generate for yourself. So this one we've seen uh, uh, several times, not just, not just today, but in previous lectures. This is the geometric series. We also saw how we can manipulate the geometric series to find other, power, uh, other infinite series. So we just did this one. We've done, we, we did. We did this one uh, today. Uh, we did this one today. Okay. Uh, so you try this. This is for you. You try this one, the sine function. So it, with the example of the uh, e to the x and the cosine function, it should be relatively straightforward to generate the Taylor series centered at zero for the sine function. And uh, as I promised uh, you earlier, and you will verify, you will notice that it, the sine function here only contains odd powers of x, and the sine function is odd cosine function is even and its Taylor series only has even powers of x. Okay, uh, somewhere I believe um, in a previous lecture and it's going to come up again on the next slide as well, uh, we have already done this. We have, we have, we have found what the um, infinite series representation of the arc tangent function is and you can get that from the geometric series. Or you can do it now with our new method of, of differentiating and finding all the coefficients on the Taylor series. And that's going to come up again in just a couple of seconds. Okay. Let me just do a, another couple of examples. Uh, we are going to find the Maclaurin series for the following functions. It says Maclaurin series like that. That means A equals to zero. Okay. 
<laughs> I want to say something here, and that is uh, you do not want to keep repeating the work over and over and over again, especially on a test that could be highly time consuming. So you're looking at this and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I've learned how to take a Taylor series. I got to take all the derivatives and evaluate them all at zero. And then you look at this thing, and you're like, oh no, right off the top, I have to apply the product rule. And then when I take the next derivative, I'm going to have to apply the product rule twice. It's going to be, it's going to be time consuming and difficult. So then stop and reconsider can you use what you already know uh, and then and then find out uh, uh, what this one is and uh, well my answer to that is yes indeed you can so let us let me show you how to do this one part a without taking all of the derivatives we already showed that e to the x is equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial that's already been done so I don't need then to uh, recompute. I, I merely can find out what the Taylor series for e to the minus 3x is via substitution. So that is going to be this, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. And what is here is minus 3x. So that is what is here, minus 3x to the n. This is substitution. Substitution is an amazing tool. It's just, <laughs> you can constantly be using it to uh, find one thing from another or to simplify problems. We've seen it lots in integration too. Okay, I'm just rewriting that. I'm taking the minus 1 to the n out and I get 3 to the n x to the n over n factorial. Okay, that problem is now I, I have a one portion of that function f of x. Now I see, oh, what do I want to do? I want to multiply by x squared. So I want to, I want to, what I want to do is go x squared, x squared times e to the minus 3x. Well, that's going to be equal to x squared times e to the minus 3x. And what is e to the minus 3x? That is this infinite series, which we just computed. Okay, then I can move the... Uh, x uh, inside and I get this here sum of n equals 0 to infinity um, there's an n there minus 1 to the n 3 to the n x to the n plus 2 that's multiplying x to the n times x squared all over n factorial and I'm finished okay that is the uh, Maclaurin series for x squared e to the minus 3x. No derivatives, no evaluating the derivatives based on the fact that I know what the uh, Taylor series centered at zero is for e to the x. Please <laughs> pause, especially in the exam when you're asked to do a question like this, especially if the derivatives look like it's going to be really ugly. There may be a way of doing it without doing a whole lot of work and you you want to find that uh, you want to find that path okay similarly we're, we're being asked here for the Maclaurin series for sine of x squared okay I am not going to take much time doing this I'm going to write out the the power series uh, for uh, sine x here it is uh, let me write it out uh, minus 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So now that I've done this, uh, what if I think to myself, hmm, I know what it looks like when it's expanded. What if I didn't quite get it right? Let me just try n equals 0 and see what happens. I get I get x and then I get when n is equal to 1, I get minus x cubed. And when n is 1 in the denominator, I get uh, 3 factorial. And then I'm going to try n equals 2. Uh, when I square, I'll get that will be positive. And then when it's 2, I get x to the 5. OK, I'll 5 factorial. And then, I, and then I'm, I'm happy that I've got the compact notation proper, because that looks proper. So I've got there um, the Taylor series expansion for sine x. I want sine x squared, so I merely do a substitution. This will be sine x squared. We'll, we'll have power series representation n equals 0 to infinity 
minus 1 to the n, and uh, I'm substituting in, uh, for x, I'm substituting in x squared, and then that's to the 2n plus 1, and that's 2n plus 1 factorial. And I can write that maybe a little bit more nicely in this manner here. Minus 1 to the n, x to the 2, oh, sorry, x to the 4n plus 2. Four n plus two and two n plus one factorial. Okay, there it is. Okay. What about x over nine minus x squared? How do I find the uh, the uh, Taylor series for that. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, this would be very painful uh, to do uh, from first principles because you're going to have to employ the quotient rule many, many times. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, hang on, what do I know? I know this 1 over 1 minus x is this one, uh, x to the n. Can I somehow do something? Oh, first of all, I can. You really easily get this, 1 over 1 minus x squared uh, via a substitution. That I could do that. And I would get this here, n equals 0 uh, to infinity. And I've substituted this would be then x to the 2n. Okay, that problem has been solved. I could easily multiply by x. And I get this, 1 minus x squared. I'm just going to multiply by x. That is going to be n equals 0 to infinity of x to the 2n plus 1. So now I just have to figure out potentially how to deal with the 9. Okay, let me think. Of, okay, so I haven't, not totally easy how to get that right here. So then I might might, might try again. I might factor that 9 out because it's like, okay, so that 1 here was kind of important. Let me factor that 9 out. I would get like this, 1 minus, let me think, that would be x over 3 squared. Okay, then I would, I would have I would be able to uh, simply uh, multiply this uh, power series by 1 9th, and I would start this whole little procedure that I just did here like that, but I would then start by substituting in x over 3 squared. Okay, so I, I, I encourage you to try that and then um, check your answer. Go just, I mean, you, you have the basic method here, so and then you have to employ this factory and then re retry this method. Go, go on Wolfram Alpha and uh, just ask it for, just type in Taylor series and type this here like that, and it'll give you the Taylor series, and you can check uh, whether you uh, did that correctly. Okay. What other kind of things can you now do that you couldn't do before? Uh, some actually pretty interesting stuff. So we are mostly having... Uh, up until now, every time we've seen an infinite series, what have we mostly done? We've asked, does it converge or does it diverge? We have not been able to actually figure out what the sum, if, if it converges, we have not been able to, for the most part, accepting the geometric series, figure out what it converges to. So we're going to get a small amount more skill uh, with that uh, now. So here's a thing. I, I have an infinite series, the part A here, uh, n equals 0 to infinity of 2 to the n over n factorial, and I ask you, what number does this... What, not, what, what number is this? Okay, so uh, it, this is not a, a function. It's, it, there's no x in it. There, it's, it's just a, 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 an addition of a whole pile of numbers. Let's just write out the few of them to see what this looks like. 2 over 1 factorial plus 2 squared over 2 factorial plus 2 cubed over 3 factorial plus dot dot dot. And I'm asking, what number is that? It's some number. If, well, if you don't believe it's some number, what you could first do is use the, uh, say, it looks like maybe you'd use the ratio test. And you would say, okay, it can, you'd, you'd assure yourself that it converges. And once you're assured that it converges, then you would think, okay, it converges to something. What number is that? Okay, so now I look at this and uh, I... I don't, it, it's a hard, in fact, to give a sort of an algorithmic thing to do, but I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, oh, I see, it's it's the, uh, this is the uh, Taylor series for e to the x evaluated when x is 2. So immediately then I can tell you that this number is e squared. Okay, because I'm looking at, I, I in, in my head is the 
e to the x, which is looks like this, 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus dot dot dot. And I see I identically will have this if x equals 2 here. Okay, if I put x equals 2 into all of those ones, I will get exactly what I'm trying to figure out to the, the sum, and then I can put 2 into there, and that gives me that answer, e squared. Okay, next, uh, next example, what number is this? this is, so here we have the alternating series on the reciprocals of the odd numbers. What number is that? You could use the alternating series test. You will see that it converges. And then you can ask, what number does that converge to? So I actually think this one is uh, um, really like super interesting in, 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 for, for a variety of reasons. But you can start here, 1 over 1 minus x. That is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n. And then uh, you could replace x with x with minus x so i would can go like this 1 over 1 minus minus x and that's going to be the sum from n equals 1 0 to infinity of minus x to the n and that is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n x to the n and then this is of course 1 over 1 plus x okay now i could replace uh, x with x squared so I could now go 1 over 1 plus x squared, and I replace x with x squared right here. I'm going to get the sum n equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n of x to the 2n. Okay, we are actually making headway. Uh, what do I do next? I'm going to integrate both sides like that. And what is this integral here? That is the arc tangent. So I'm going to have that the arc tangent of x is equal to, and I'm going to integrate on the uh, right hand side term by term. That is going to be looking like this then, minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Okay. If I were to evaluate this when x equals to 1, so now I'm thinking now evaluate at x equals 1, and we get the arc tangent of 1 is equal to the sum of n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n. I've just evaluated at x equals 1, so that's over 2n plus 1. That is exactly this thing here. So this is 1 minus 1 third plus 1 fifth minus 1 seventh. And that is the arc tangent of 1. But we know what the arc tangent of 1 is. That is 45, 45 degrees or pi by 4. And of course, we're always working in radians. So then I've now figured out that pi by 4 is 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh plus a ninth. So pi is showing up again. Here we have it showing up in the context of the alternating series of the reciprocals of the odd numbers. So that's a, that's a really cool. Actually, it gives you a method, in fact, of estimating pi. Uh, it's a lousy method to estimate pi because uh, it converges very slowly. But uh... Peter, turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Sorry about that. A little bit of noise happening here. Don't well. Don't bring it out here. Go in the kitchen. Don't bring it closer. So, sorry about that. Okay, we have <laughs> there's a home office uh, situation here. Okay, so we now have a method uh, uh, for uh, evaluating uh, pi, a slowly converging method. So we can figure out that pi is equal to four times one minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh, like that. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. We have uh, now uh, a couple of other things that uh, we are able to do uh, with our new uh, expertise on the uh, uh, series approximations for it, for these numbers. Okay. Here's a limit. 
so it's kind of back in calculus one, we could look at this limit and we could quickly uh, determine that it's an indeterminate form, zero over zero. We could, as you have learned to do in the past, use L'Hopital's rule directly and take the derivative of the numerator. And that's going to be sine x, and then take the derivative of the denominator, and that's going to be minus minus e to the x, and then take the limit, and then it, see what happens as x goes to zero, and that's still zero over zero. And that way we could use L'Hopital's rule again and get this thing here: uh, cos x over minus e to the x, and that is minus one. Okay, that's one way that that and that's the, the correct answer that that limit it does evaluate to minus one however let me show you now that we could do this another way we could take the limit as x goes to zero and i could replace the cosine and the e to the x with their power series representations okay so i'm replacing cos x with its power series representation i'm replacing e to the x with its power series representation and then I'm taking 1 minus the cosine and 1 plus x minus e to the x. And this is what I get. I get uh, x squared over uh, 2 factorial minus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus x to the 6 over 6 factorial, etc. And then in the denominator, I get minus x squared over 2 factorial minus x cubed over 3 factorial minus x to the 4 over uh, 4 factorial, etc. I have this this thing here, and then I can see that I have a, a I can do a few things here. One one is I could simply factor out an x squared um, from numerator and denominator. Why don't I do that actually? So I'm gonna say that that's equal to the limit as x goes to zero. I'm gonna factor out x squared in the numerator, and I'm gonna get 1 over 2 factorial minus x squared over 4 factorial plus x to the 4 over 6 factorial, etc. And then in the denominator, I have minus x squared, and I have um, 1 over 2 factorial minus x over 3 factorial plus x squared over 4 factorial, etc. Those will cancel out. And then I can let x uh, go to zero, and I get here a minus one. Okay, so I can I can now take a, a limit in, a, in perhaps an easier way uh, by using the Taylor series. Okay, I'm going to do one example. Uh, actually, I'm I'm going to do two examples. I'm going to do two examples of how to find a Taylor series not centered at zero. So the previous ones have all been centered at zero. Now I'm going to do a an example with the Taylor series centered at a given value of a. So in the first example, a will be 1. In the second example, a will be pi. Okay, so uh, I am going to proceed right from first principles. I'm going to take a look at all n derivatives of the function and establish the Taylor series. This is going to be fn of x, and then this is going to be f n of 1. Why is that 1? Because a is 1. Okay, so I'm going to evaluate all the derivatives at 1. So here's the function, that e to the minus x, and then the first derivative is minus e to the minus x, the next derivative is e to the minus x, the next derivative is minus e to the minus x, etc. Then I'm going to evaluate all those derivatives at 1, and I get e to the minus 1, minus e to the minus 1, e to the minus 1, minus e to the minus 1, etc. Okay, now I can immediately write out uh, the uh, Taylor series for uh, e to the minus x centered at x equals 1. So it looks like this, e to the minus 1 minus e to the minus 1 over 1 factorial times x minus 1. Okay, we are centered at 1. That's why that's, now we're, we're the Taylor series is in powers of x minus 1 plus e to the minus 1 uh, x minus 1 squared over 2 factorial minus e to the minus 1 x minus 1 cubed over 3 factorial 
plus dot dot dot. Okay, then I can write that more compactly. It looks like this. The sum from n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times x minus 1 to the n all over e times n factorial. Okay, now this e here is from here. Okay, so that is the Taylor series for e to the minus x centered about 1. Okay, our final example. We're gonna we're gonna get the Taylor series for sine two x centered at pi. Procedure the same. N F N of X and F N evaluated at pi. So that's zero one. 2, 3, 4, 5. The zeroth derivative is the function. And then I form the derivatives. And it's going to be 2 cos 2x minus 4 sine 2x. Third derivative minus 8 cos 2x. Fourth derivative 16 sine 2x, etc. And then I evaluate them at pi. So I'm going to have here sine. 2 pi, that's 0. Here I'm going to have 2 cos 2 pi, and that is 2. And then the next one's going to be minus 4 sine 2 pi, and that is 0. And then I have minus 8 cos 2 pi, and that is minus 8, etc. I keep going, and I... Uh, get the coefficients and I start to write out what is the Taylor series of sine 2x centered at pi. And it looks like this, 0, that is the 0 right here, plus 2 times x minus pi over 1 factorial, so that 2 is right here, minus 8 times x minus pi cubed over 3 factorial, and that is this 8 right here. And then uh, there's no power, there's no x squared power because of this 0. And then the next one is 32 x minus pi to the fifth power over 5 factorial. And I do as many of these as I need to do before I see the pattern, and I can write this in this manner sine 2x is equal to the sum of n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n, 2 to the 2n plus 1, x minus pi to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Again, I would highly recommend that you take this and you re-expand back and see whether you can uh, regenerate those things so that you can be sure that you've put you've got the notation correct. Okay, that was a long lecture. Um, um, perhaps uh, going back through and doing some of these examples yourself would be a very good idea. The ability to generate uh, these things and form Taylor polynomials is an extremely important concept. Thank you.